On October 23, 2077, the start of the Great War marked the end of humanity as we know it. Infrastructure and societal systems were destroyed, much of humanity perished, and latent radiation transformed what were mostly harmless creatures into brooding monstrosities. But not all of the wasteland's fiercest creatures are a product of nuclear fallout. Rather, some beasts were actually genetically created before the Great War. Prior to the end of the world, the insatiable thirst for scientific advancement and power led humanity to pursue a series of sick and twisted experiments. Through their work, pre-war scientists and governments were able to genetically craft marvels and horrors that still endure to this day. These are five pre-war fallout monsters. Pre-war FEV mutants. We're going to start with an obvious bonus. As I recently made a video about FEV, I don't want to spend too long talking about pre-war FEV mutants. The origins of many FEV mutants within Fallout trace back to experimental efforts prior to the Great War. The forced evolutionary virus, initially conceived as an immunity agent under a different name, quickly caught the attention of the US military due to its interesting side effects. After years of experimentation at multiple locations across the United States, a few viable monstrosities were born. The creation of super mutants, hulking humanoids with increased strength and resilience, were the results of FEV exposure. Both Vault 87 and the West Tech Research Facility in Appalachia had success with creating a stable FEV super mutant prior to the Great War. Both the Snallygaster and Grafton Monster are derived from FEV experimentation in Appalachia. During the chaos at the start of the Great War, these mutants were able to break free from their confines and roam the newly created wasteland. And the prevailing theory for the origins of the floaters is from experiments using the virus on flatworms. While this has yet to be confirmed in-game, that floaters are mutated flatworms, these goofy guys do bear some semblance to the nasty parasite. That covers some of the pre-war FEV mutants. Let's get on with the actual list now. The Cazador. Menacingly fluttering through the arid expanse that is the Mojave Wasteland, the infamous Cazador strikes terror into the hearts of even the most hardened wasteland wanderers. But before they became a chilling presence in the scorching desert, these nightmarish insects were being tinkered on and experimented with over two centuries prior. The origins of the fearsome Cazador can be tracked back to before the Great War, at a time when scientific experimentation and genetic manipulation was quite common. These mutated insects with their venomous stings and aggressive nature offer a haunting glimpse into the climate of pre-war America, a place where pushing the boundaries of nature and science was the norm. The Cazador was crafted in the Z14 Pepsinay DNA Splicing Lab of the Big Mountain Research and Development Center. The Big Empty, a crucible of both innovation and recklessness, became the birthplace of many scientific endeavors that would both shape and haunt the future. It would be here that a team of the most brilliant minds that America could offer would converge. Among these visionaries was the once brilliant Dr. Boros. Dr. Boros, a talented but ethically questionable scientist, would be the man responsible for the Cazadors. In the early 2000s, driven by a desire to push science to and past its absolute edge, Boros and his team would embark on a series of genetic experiments aimed at enhancing the attributes of various creatures. Cazadors would be one of these. Resembling a larger tarantula hawk wasp, the Cazador is a cross between the aforementioned wasp and several other unknown creatures. Regardless of its true genetic makeup, the result of these pre-war DNA splicings is the nightmarish Cazador. The Cazador is a relentless hunter, using its heightened senses, agility, and venomous sting to dispatch any perceived threat. 
often found in packs, the fate of any poor chap who happened upon them seems all but certain, an excruciating and painful death. So it's a good thing that they're contained at the big empty facility, right? Well, according to the old Boros, they still are, though reality is the opposite. At some point, these menacing insects manage to escape their supposed captivity, migrating to the Mojave. Here they multiplied and thrived, cementing their place as a perilous predator in the post-apocalyptic food chain. As we'll soon see, the creation of the Khazadors was part of a broader pattern of unchecked scientific ambition within the Big Empty and the rest of pre-war America. Proper ethics and morals were often disregarded and overshadowed by the pursuit of scientific advancement at any cost. Even 200 years later, Khazadors remain as a dark reminder of humanity's audacious yet reckless pursuit of scientific experimentation, its consequences lingering long after the world had crumbled to ruins. The Night Stalker The next creature whose existence began before the Great War is one that shares many similarities with the Khazadors, the prowling Night Stalkers. Roaming the shadowy corners of the Mojave, the elusive and eerie Night Stalkers have found themselves intertwined with the post-apocalyptic ecosystem. However, prior to their post-war prowling, they were being genetically spliced right next door to the Khazador. Night Stalkers, much like Khazadors, owe their existence to the ambitious genetic tinkering within the Big Empty Research Center. Created in the Xenine Croatless DNA Preservation Lab, the Night Stalker was yet another construct of Dr. Boros's gene splicing experiment. Believing that rattlesnakes were on the decline, or simply because of a dare, Boros can't recall, the mad scientist spliced the DNA of a rattlesnake with the DNA of a coyote. The result was, of course, this monstrous coyote rattlesnake hybrid, what is known as a Night Stalker. The Night Stalker's appearance shares notable features of both creatures. Its torso and legs resemble a standard coyote, being quite dog-like and covered in fur. But its head, tail, fangs, venom, and forked tongue are of course more reminiscent of a rattlesnake. In the end, you have this creature that, from far away, looks like a standard dog. But when that gap is closed, one will start to see the more subtle reptile features. Best not let it get up close. Characterized by their unique blend of traits, Night Stalkers have earned their name for their uncanny ability to stalk prey under the Shroud of Darkness, striking with a swift and silent ferocity. Their venomous bite leaves victims in agonizing pain, eventually leading to death, a fate met by the reckless Dr. Callus after deciding to deal with the aggressive beasts head on. Just as Khazadors found their way into the Mojave Wasteland, Night Stalkers too ventured beyond the confines of the Big Empty, adapting and thriving in the harsh, post-apocalyptic landscape. Their migration and continued survival centuries later demonstrates not only the resilience, but also the horror behind humanity's pre-war experimentation. The Death Claw Continuing our exploration of creatures which were concocted before the bombs fell, we turn our attention to the apex predator of the wastes, the fearsome Deathclaw. Within the Fallout universe, few creatures instill as much fear and dread as the Deathclaw. These towering reptilian predators with their razor-sharp claws and aggressive nature are a prime example at showing the consequences of the sort of unchecked scientific experimentation that took place before the Great War. The origins of the Death Claws can be traced back to the often secretive and sinister laboratories of the pre-war government's military. As humanity teetered on the brink of global catastrophe, with the Resource and Sino-American Wars raging on, the United States military was performing research into making the ultimate living weapon. It was within these secret military research facilities that the Death Claws were brought into existence. The Fallout 2 Official Strategies and Secrets Guide 
notes that Deathclaws were originally created to replace humans during close combat search and destroy missions. By using a mixture of genetic material from various animals, primarily the Jackson's chameleon, scientists were able to successfully craft the ferocious predator. What the government now had was a massive bipedal killing machine. However, as there is no documentation or references indicating that they had been used in any known military missions, we can only assume that these beasts were left in captivity prior to the Great War. And maybe that was for the best. Heightened senses, unparalleled strength, and extraordinary adaptability made the Deathclaw a uniquely self-sufficient beast. If given the opportunity, the Deathclaw could find its way into any climate and settle into any ecosystem as the apex predator. And so when the air sirens blared and the nuclear bombs began to fall, the Deathclaw did just that. No longer confined to secret research labs, the Deathclaw would gradually spread across the many wastelands. Just as the Deathclaws physically began to spread across the wasteland, so too did their legend, reaching a sort of mythical status among many wastelanders. Now, the legacy of the Deathclaw serves as a stark reminder of pre-war humanity's pursuit of power. While the original purpose of creating the ultimate living weapon was achieved, it came at the cost of unleashing a mythical force of nature that continues to terrorize the post-apocalyptic world. The Wanamingo In a similar vein to the Deathclaw, what was once thought to be extraterrestrial life actually turned out to be a living weapon itself, and that is the Wanamingo. These eerie beings with their otherworldly appearance come from a time before the Great War. Wanamingos are a bizarre and hostile creature that were created through pre-war genetic experimentation using the ever-infamous forced evolutionary virus. They are characterized by their distinct lack of a torso, tentacle-like appendages, and razor-sharp teeth. Wanamingos have a fearsome reputation for being quite resilient towards small arms fire and being stronger than a bull brahmin. The origins of the Wanamingo can be traced back to some secretive military research base, where evidently some mighty sinister experiments using the forced evolutionary virus were taking place. Whether this was the Mariposa military base or not, we can't be sure. From Fallout Bible Zero, the Wanamingos are a result of FEV virus experimentation. They are not aliens, but word is that they were designed as FEV tailored weapons for waging war on other countries, and they got loose. The name Wanamingo is derived from the town of Reading in Fallout 2, where its citizens didn't know what else to call these critters. Their existence as a species heavily relies on the eggs hatched from the Wanamingo queen. With no queen, the Wanamingos are sure to die off. While not traditionally an intelligent species, they are described to have a sort of hive mind. Encounters with Wanamingos are particularly dangerous due to their resilience and swarming behavior. And while the Wanamingo species is dying off by the start of Fallout 2 in 2241, their presence shows the lasting impact of pre-war humanity's scientific endeavors on the post-apocalyptic world. And finally, mole rats. And the final pre-war followed creature is the unsuspecting and innocuous mole rat. While some do seem to be the product of radiation-induced enlargement, as noted by an Enclave field report, it would seem that other species of these subterranean rodents have a unique history that ties back to pre-war experiments. The roots of the mole rat mutations can be traced back to a government science and military project known as Mission Cloacina. As outlined in a Citadel terminal entry, Mission Cloacina aimed to weaponize a creature known as Mutant Undermining Lifeform to disrupt Chinese infrastructure and ecosystems. These mutant rats, and assumedly they were mole rats, would be covertly released into an enemy's environment where their aggressive qualities, dangerous hunter, and pervasive breeding would severely undermine the infrastructure of the location, softening the target for a manned ground invasion. 
Once the rats had achieved their mission, a kill switch would be activated, allowing for, in the terminal entry's own words, a one-time cleanup effort. While there is some uncertainty if the mutant undermining lifeform was indeed a breed of mole rat, it is known that mole rats do indeed tunnel and also violently react to Moira's repellent stick, perhaps foreshadowing Mission Cloachina's kill switch influence. Outside of Mission Cloachina, we do know that Vault 81 in the Commonwealth was stocked with a population of oversized mole rats for initial testing of their universal cure. As the vault was, of course, stocked with supplies and goods prior to the Great War, it would seem that oversized mole rats existed then as well. Following the Great War, mole rats have spread and populate much of the wasteland. While for seasoned adventurers they seldom pose a threat, their sharp claws, teeth, and ambush style attacks still warrant caution. While mole rats are likely the least dangerous foe on this list, their resilience demonstrates the unknowing capabilities of pre-war America. As survivors of the nuclear holocaust navigate the barren wastes, they encounter not only the ferocity of the mentioned creatures, but also the lasting impact of unchecked scientific ambition. These creatures, survivors of pre-war genetic experiments, remind us of the complexities that come from mixing humanity's desire for power with the unpredictable forces of nature. Centuries later, these creatures live on as relics of a time long gone. Thank you for listening. If you like the video, be sure to share and subscribe. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. No, such creatures are found only here, for research purposes. They would no more be capable of escape than breeding.